So now it's time for the third and final uh, talk of this session, which is uh, going to be anonymous, robust post-quantum public key encryption by uh, Varun Maram. And uh, Varun is here, so I will uh, let him introduce his co-author and welcome him to the stage. So please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Martin, and uh, I would like to thank everyone present here um, because um, I know that it can be a bit of a pain to attend these uh, morning sessions during a conference. So I hope to make this less boring for you guys. Um, so here I'm going to talk about um, um, po uh, anonymous and robust public key encryption schemes in a post-quantum setting. So in my talk, I'll be giving an overview of some of our main results. And this is based on a joint work with uh, Paul Grubbs from University of Michigan and my PhD advisor, Kenny Patterson. Um, oops. Oops, yeah. So yeah, so uh, the main setting of our work uh, is related to uh, NIST's ongoing post-quantum cryptography standardization process, where we have um, uh, the four uh, finalists and five alternate candidates uh, that are uh, currently being considered for standardization in uh, the public key encryption category. And, and the main criteria of evaluation for these schemes was on uh, how well these schemes achieve the so-called uh, NCCA notion of security. And rightfully so, because uh, NCCA security is usually considered to be like a gold standard because it suffices for most cryptographic applications. But in this work, we were mainly interested in evaluating the relative fitness of these candidates in other important applications that require security properties beyond NCCA. So one such property that we considered was uh, so-called anonymity or uh, NOCCA security to be more formal. So anonymity roughly guarantees that the ciphertext uh, does not leak the public key, which was used to encrypt the corresponding message. So for example, in the setting with Alice, so if Alice wants to send a message M uh, to Bob, and she wants to hide the fact that she's communicating uh, with Bob uh, from other third parties like Eve, then what she does is that she encrypts the message under Bob's public key, and then somehow broadcasts the ciphertext to a subset of user, uh, including Bob, such that the resulting ciphertext, uh, uh, Eve cannot be able to figure out who was the intended receiver of Alice's message. That is, Al, uh, Eve should not be able to figure out which public key was used. And anonymity uh, was uh, formalized by Bellari et al. in 2001, and it was shown to be um, like, uh, it's pretty much considered to be like a standard security notion at this point. And uh, it has, uh, it's also uh, an important component in different modern applications, such as uh, private uh, cryptocurrencies like Zcash. Uh, but maybe on hindsight, I should have removed this from my slide um, after listening to the community's thoughts on cryptocurrencies from the RUM session. But it has other important applications such as in digital auctions, anonymous credentials, and other uh, applications. If your application requires anonym anonymity in some form, then chances are you would require a PK scheme which satisfies this notion of anonymity. Now, let's come back to the same example. Now, because of anonymity, even uh, the users Carol and Dave should not be able to tell who was the intended receiver of Alice's message. So the naive thing that all of these users would do is that they just try to decrypt the uh, receive ciphertext using their respective secret keys. So for example, in this setting, if uh, Dave, uh, upon obtaining the ciphertext C from Alice, uh, if uh, he decrypts the ciphertext using his own secret key and requires some valid message M double prime, then he might mistakenly think that Alice wanted to send the message M double prime to him, which is not the case. So to prevent such ambiguity, we additionally require uh, another uh, complementary security property uh, known as robustness or SROP CCA to be more formal. So strong robustness guarantees that it's hard to come up with the ciphertext such that it decrypts validly under two different secret keys. So in this setting, if Carol and Dave try to decrypt such a ciphertext, then they should get back an error, which implicitly means that the message is not intended to them. Uh, again, robustness was formalized by Abdallah et al. Uh, in a public key setting uh, in 2010. 
and um, it, it's also an important security property in its own right, uh, for example, in searchable encryption schemes and other important applications. All right, so now uh, let's uh, come back to our NIST candidates. So all of these NIST candidates, they construct their NCC secure PKE schemes by first constructing an NCC secure CAM, and then they compose things, uh, these CAMs in a standard way with a one-time uh, authenticated encryption scheme to obtain their final PKE. Here I'm assuming familiarity with CAMs and their security properties. Um, and yeah, so uh, just uh, to um, put things in a brief way. Uh, so if Alice wants to send a message to Bob, then what she does is first she runs this asymmetric chem component uh, to generate uh, this key K uh, using Bob's public key. And then this key is actually used to encrypt the message using the symmetric chem component. And in this con uh, context, such PK schemes are known as hybrid PK schemes. Right. Uh, and it's it's pretty well known that uh, if you have an NCC secure cam, you compose them with uh, an authenticated encryption scheme, and then you get an NCC secure PK scheme, thanks to uh, Kramer and Shoup. But now, what if in addition to NCC security, I want my hybrid PK scheme to satisfy anonymity? Uh, at least in this talk, we'll be uh, focusing only on anonymity and ro not robustness because of time restrictions. So. Um, yeah, and just to uh, put, uh, put things in an informal way, so roughly speaking by anonymity, I mean that encryption of a message M under Bob's public key should be somehow indistinguishable from the encryption of the same message under a different public key, say Dave's public key. So one of our main results uh, in this work was to show what additional properties we require of our chem to ensure that the final PK scheme is uh, satisfies anonymity. So we showed that uh, if our chem um, if it's NCC secure as before, but if it also satisfies a notion of anonymity, where here uh, I mean that uh, the encapsulation under Bob's public key should be indistinguishable from the encapsulation under a different public key. And if the chem also satisfies a notion of weak robustness, that is, if you encapsulate under Bob's public key, but then you decapsulate using a different secret key, you get back an error. So if our chem satisfies these two additional security properties, then if our dem is again a standard authenticated encryption scheme, then the final PK scheme that does satisfy anonymity. This was one of our main results. Uh, and we would like to point out that this, uh, our result is a generalization of Mohasil's result back in 2010, because he considered uh, specific chems which are constructed directly from PK schemes. So I start with the PK scheme and to, uh, uh, to construct my chem, I just encrypt a random message from the message space, um, and that will be my chem. Uh, but here we consider a general class, a class of chems, because we know that NIST chems are not constructed in this way that Mohasel considered. So technically speaking, uh, Mohasel's result does not really apply to the NIST candidates. So now let's uh, try to zoom in on this weak robustness requirement that we require of our chem. In our work, we also show that not only is this weak robustness requirement sufficient, but it's, all, it's also somehow necessary because we, con uh, we constructed an artificial example of a chem which satisfies NCC security, anonymity, but not weak robustness, such that if you compose it with a DEM, which is a one-time authenticated encryption scheme, then the resulting PK scheme does not satisfy anonymity. And the counter example holds no matter how clever, how strong you make your DEM. So this shows that somehow your weak robustness is necessary and sufficient. And now, uh, then recall that weak robustness requires that if you encapsulate under Bob's public key, but decapsulate under a different secret key, you should get back an error. So implicitly, this means that if a chem is robust, then the decapsulation algorithm should be capable of returning an error symbol. Unfortunately, more um, like all of the niche candidates except HQC, are so-called implicit rejection chems. By implicit rejection, I mean that the decapsulation algorithm never returns an error symbol. It always spits out some bit string, but never error. So hence, uh, yeah, our chemdom composition re result looks cool and nice and all, but uh, if you want to apply this to the niche chems, it does not apply. So, so hence, to uh, somehow salvage this, we, ha we took a closer look of how these implicit rejection camps are constructed in the first place by these NIST candidates. 
So th these NIST candidates, they constructed NCC secure chems via a generic uh, a technique known as the Fujisaki Okamoto transformation. So what they do is they first construct a weakly secure base PK scheme, which satisfies one witness against CPA attacks. And then they compose their PK scheme with a couple of hash functions in a very clever way, such that the resulting chem is NCC secure. But for this weak security to strong security transformation to work, we additionally need to assume that our hash functions behave as so-called quantum random oracles. That is, uh, we should be able to query these quantum random oracles on a superposition of inputs and get back a superposition of random outputs. And now let's, uh, let's focus on the NIST finalists for the moment, these four NIST finalists. Now, each of these finalists use uh, variants of these, uh, this generic FO transformation to construct their chems. So more specifically, the first three candidates, Classic, McKinley, Skyver, and Saber, they use variants of this FO transformation in the literature. Uh, it's called FO superscript notebot. Uh, I'll just call it FO um, in this presentation. Uh, you don't have to look at how this scheme works. We'll come back to this later. But these three schemes use uh, variants of this standard FO transformation in the literature to construct their chems. Also, another alternate candidate for a chem also uses a variant of this specific FO transformation. So in our work, we focused on these three NIST finalists and this alternate candidate. Uh, and now it was shown by Jiang et al. Uh, in 2018 that the standard FO transformation does result in NCC secure chems in the quantum random oracle model. And in, in our work, we showed that if the base PK scheme satisfies some additional mild security properties, namely that of weak uh, anonymity and some kind of weak robustness, then the resulting chem also is anonymous. Um, so uh, I won't be going to deta details what uh, these properties exactly are, but for the purpose of this presentation, you can think of them as some CPA style weak properties. But then in the end, you get some strong anonymity guarantees. Uh, towards this result, at least on a high level, we extended uh, Jiang et al's proof techniques in a single key pair setting in the context of NCC security, uh, and we extended to a two key pair setting in the context of uh, anonymity. Because if you recall in the NCC security game, the challenger samples a single key pair, but uh, in the anonymity setting, the challenger generates two key pairs. I mean, this change looks small, but in the context of uh, performing security analysis in this two-keeper setting, it creates some additional headaches. Okay, so now let's zoom out and again, let, let's come back to our chemdem composition result, which unfortunately does not apply to these chems because of this weak robustness requirement. And uh, one good news is that in our work, we showed that for uh, we can overcome this generic impossibility result by focusing on a specific class of chems, which are obtained by this standard FO notebook transformation. So we, uh, we showed that you can somehow replace the weak robustness requirement with the gamma spreadness requirement of your base PK scheme. Now, for, for those of you who don't know, so gamma spreadness means that if you have a randomized uh, base PK scheme, so for any message and for any fixed message and uh, uh, for any fixed public key, if you encrypt the message, then the ciphertext uh, distribution should have sufficiently large entropy. And gamma spreadness is a very standard uh, property in uh, in current uh, in the NIST PK schemes, for example. So yeah, so now we have a good news. So we have at least now some hope of obtaining uh, anonymous PK schemes when we have our starting chem to be a NIST chem, which is implicitly rejecting. So now then we, in our work, we uh, wanted to apply, uh, we wanted to do a case study of these four uh, schemes. So first we focused on classic McAleese. Unfortunately, uh, the base PK scheme used by classic McAleese is a deterministic scheme. So by definition, it does not satisfy the notion of gamma spreadness. So again, uh, we are in an unfortunate scenario where again, the result looks cool, but it does not apply to the concrete scheme of classic McAleese. But now let's focus on uh, robustness. So what can we say at least robustness of uh, classic McAleese PK scheme? Uh, because uh, I did mention in the uh, earlier on in my talk that uh, robustness is an important security property in its own right. Uh, now, I won't be going into the lower level details, but we showed that because of the way the base PK scheme of classic McAleese is defined, we can export some of its properties to show that for any message M that Alice wants to send to Bob using classic McAleese, we can construct 
a, a hybrid ciphertext C such that if you try to decrypt the same ciphertext, not only using Bob's secret key, but any secret key in the classic Michaeli system, not only we, do we get a valid message, but we get back the same message M that Alice wanted to send to Bob. So this is a peculiar property, but it is sufficient to break the formal notion of strong robustness for classic Michaelis. And this result holds no matter how clever, how strong you make your DEM. Yeah. Uh, but in subsequent uh, work to ours, so Kusagawa was able to show that classic Michaelis PK scheme can be somehow made anonymous by choosing an appropriate uh, DEM. Uh, so this would be the only spoiler in my talk, if you are really interested in this. So Kusagawa will be presenting his results in the last session of the day. I highly recommend attending his talk if you are interested in this line of work. Uh, but uh, I'll be just uh, uh, talking a bit about his work. So on a high level, so we have been focusing on this two key paired notion of anonymity, which makes analysis a bit non-trivial. Uh, but Kusagawa relied on a single key pair notion known as strong pseudorandomness and it turns out that if a PK scheme satisfies this strong pseudorandomness then it automatically satisfies anonymity. You get anonymity for free. So then since you can focus all of your analysis in the single key pair setting it makes analysis a bit tractable. Uh, but one final thing I want to remark about Kusagawa's talk because uh, uh, Kuska will be talking more about uh, the res his results in later on, is that uh, he was able to show anonymity of classic Michaelis by somehow modifying the assumptions used by classic Michaelis for its NCCA security. Whereas in our work, wherever possible, we want to stick to the same assumptions used by these NIST candidates for their NCCA security. We don't want to introduce any new assumptions. Right. So this is it for classic Michaelis. So now let's move on to uh, uh, Kyber and Saber. So the reason I grouped these two schemes together will be made clear later on. But now here is again our uh, uh, chemtem composition result. And it can be shown that the base PK scheme used by Kyber, both Kyber and Saber, does satisfy gamma spreadness for a sufficiently large, for um, cryptographically large gamma. So that's, that's great. So now we only need to show that if these schemes satisfy anonymity, then we get back a PK scheme with the desired properties. Now here was the effort transform that I showed earlier on from the literature for which we do have some positive anonymity results. However, the effort transform used by Crystal Skyber and Saber, they differ from the standard effort transformation in the literature in quite significant ways. So uh, just to uh, give you a high level overview, so in the standard effort transformation literature, the derived key, the, the key derivation works by first sampling a random message, encrypting the message, then you have the message M and the ciphertext C, and then you hash M and C to get your key. But in Crystal Skyber and Saber, you first hash the message G of M, and then you also hash the ciphertext F of C, and then you hash both those hashes, like there's too much hashes going on, like why? And uh, because of this additional layer of hashing, unfortunately, we couldn't extend our positive results with respect to the standard effort transform to this specific weird transform of Kyber and Saber. But what's more interesting is that the same barriers should also apply when you try to extend the NCC security proof of Jiang et al of the standard effort transformation in the literature to the specific effort transform used by Kyber and Saber. Uh, at least to end things on a some, somewhat uh, brighter note, we were at least able to show that when you fo when you come to robustness, uh, the chem used by uh, the, the chem of Kyber and Saber, it does satisfy some robustness in double quotes because recall that implicit rejection chems cannot be robust by definition, but somehow they satisfy this weak property that uh, it is hard to come up with a ciphertext such that if you decapsulate using two different secret keys, the outputs should not be the same. The outputs would be valid for sure, but it should not collide. And we showed that this requirement is enough to show that if you choose your DEM uh, appropriately, then your final PK scheme can be made strongly robust. So there is a way, there is some hope, there is a way to achieve uh, strong robustness uh, in the PK schemes of uh, Kyber and Saber. But this is in contrast to classic Michaelis, because no matter how clever, how strong you make your DEM, classic Michaelis PK schemes cannot be made robust. And finally, uh, let's come to Florochem, the alternate candidate. 
Again, it can be shown that the base PK scheme used by Frodo Chem uh, does satisfy this notion of gamma spreadness. And now the only thing that needs to be looked at is does it satisfy anonymity? Again, this is the standard effort transformation in the literature, and this is the weird effort transformation used by Frodo Chem. Again, it differs things. Uh, again, there's, there are some subtle differences. So again, in FO, the key is derived as hash of M and C. But here now, there's only one hash. There's only the message is hashed uh, hash in a nested way, but the ciphertext is left alone. So it's slightly a uh, good thing because, uh, uh, yeah, only a nested hashing of M and not C. Because even though, again, uh, the prior proof techniques does not necessarily apply to Frodo Chem in a direct way, we were able, to, in our work, we were able to recover the NCC security guarantees of Frodo Chem with the same probable, uh, with the same concrete bounds as stated in the specification document, solely because of the fact that the ciphertext is untouched, but the message is uh, hashed in a nested way. And the hash is also a length preserving hash, as in, G of M, G of M has the same length as uh, as that of M. So I won't be going into details, but if you're interested, I would encourage you to read our paper. And this way of uh, the uh, because of the way that we recovered NCC security guarantees of Frodochem, it also allowed us to prove anonymity of Frodochem as well in the QROM with concrete bounds. And hence, if you again care about robustness, as we have seen for Kyber and Saber, by choosing our DEM appropriately. Uh, we conclude that Frodo can best result in anonymous and robust PK schemes in a post quantum setting, our goal that we set out with uh, in the beginning of this talk. And for a few other contributions, so we have been focusing on effort transformations which result in implicit rejection chems. But there is uh, an effort transformation uh, in the literature which results in explicit rejection chems. Note here that the decapsulation uh, does result an error. Such that, uh, so Jiang, uh, Zhang, and Ma, they showed that this transformation does have provable security guarantees uh, in the QROM. It does result in NCC security chems. In our work, which, uh, so the only difference in the HFO transformation is that now your ciphertext has an additional hash here, C2, uh, where you hash the M as well. So this is somehow called the plain text confirmation hash. So your ciphertext is a bit longer, but it's fine. Uh, at least to prove security in the QROM. Uh, in our work, we showed that if you replace this hash by another hash, like uh, where you also hash the C1, then uh, it turns out that this transformation, not only does it result in NCC secure chems, but also anonymous and strongly robust chems in the QROM. And it's a nice thing because now we can just take such a chem and apply our earlier chem dem composition re result without caring a lot about the internal workings of the chem in a non-black box manner. So to conclude my talk, so here uh, we started by showing that how one can hope to achieve anonymous and robust hybrid PK schemes when the starting chem is an implicit rejection chem, as is the case for most NIST candidates. And the, the main thing that we showed is that we can overcome such uh, impossibility results by looking at such implicit rejection chems in a non-black box manner. So namely, uh, we focused on chems which are obtained by this FO transformation. And then we showed that such FO-based chems do result in uh, anonymous and robust chems in a post-quantum setting, and which could also result in anonymous robust hybrid PK schemes in the end. And then we uh, did a case study of the NIST finalists. So here's our sum summary again. So we showed that classic Michaelis hybrid PK schemes cannot be robust, unfortunately. But they can be made anonymous uh, as shown by Kusagawa. Again, if you're interested, please do attend his talk, in the, uh, which later on. Uh, then coming to Kyber and Saber, we identified some barriers uh, towards proving their NCC security and also anonymity. Uh, but somehow we were able to show that they do result in strongly robust hybrid PK schemes. Uh, so one thing, worth, one thing worth pointing out is that even Kusagawa leaves proving anonymity of Kyber and Saber to be an open problem. Uh, and finally, uh, to end things on a positive note, we showed that the alternate candidate for Rokem does result in anonymous and robust hybrid PK schemes in the QROM. Uh, yeah, so this brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. So if there's any questions, please uh, either type them in Zulip or go to a microphone. Yes. 
Uh, you mentioned that in the security proof for Frodo Chem here, uh, you uh, derived some concrete parameters or some security losses. Can you comment on roughly how big they are? Uh, yeah, so generally uh, security proofs in the QROM tend to be non-tight compared to their ROM counterparts. Uh, so one, not sure if it's a fortunate or an unfortunate thing is that, yeah, security proof in the QROM tend to be non-tight, but if you look at these concrete parameters in their NIST candidates, like in the NIST specification documents, they choose the parameters not based on the tightness of the security proof, but on the worst, on the best known attacks on their underlying lattices. So yeah, maybe, from a very pessimistic point of view, you can say that maybe these tightness of the security proof doesn't really matter in choosing the concrete parameters in the scheme, but still it should at least give us some confidence uh, in terms of provable security guarantees. Mm. So yeah, I would say that the the proofs are non-tight, mm. but they're not used to choose select the parameters. So just a bit more specifically, is it like a linear in the number of uh, quantum and oracle calls? Or? Uh, it's quadratic. Quadratic, okay, thank you. Okay, there's time for one small question. Yeah, please go to the microphone. So you, you said that uh, to get uh, suddenly, f even if you start from CCA secure and CCA anonymous CAM, uh, the transformation to CCA and anonymous encryption, somewhat surprisingly, requires some form of robustness. Uh, I don't believe you gave an explanation why. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a good question. So um, so uh, I did uh, talk about earlier on that this robust is somehow not only sufficient but also necessary because we came with an artificial counter example where if we have a chem which satisfies anonymity in the CCA, intuitively, okay. Yeah. Uh, so I have to go into the nitty gritty details of the security proof, but uh, let's say okay. So the ciphertext, the hybrid ciphertext, right? It's made up of a chem component and a dem component, right? And you want to reduce it to the anonymity of the chem, right? So now somehow uh, you want to make sure that, so if you are the adversary uh, against the anonymity of the chem, you only have the decapsulation, access to a decapsulation oracle and not access to the hybrid decryption oracle. So you somehow want to make sure that if the adversary against the anonymity of the hybrid scheme, if he gives you a ciphertext which has the chem component to be the challenge ciphertext, but the dem could be anything, you want to return a, an error with respect to both decapsulation oracles against SK0 and SK1. So for that, you somehow need weak robustness. I'm sorry if I have to be very, but I can, we can discuss it often if you're really uh, interested. I'll be present, I won't be hiding in the coffee break. Like. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll grab hold of him for you so he can't <laughs> escape. Um, so with that, uh, uh, that concludes the session. So let's thank uh, the speaker again.